Unit 5, which is more or less talking about fiscal and monetary policy. And we're going to be talking about the effects of fiscal and monetary policy on the economy as a whole. So, we already talked about this in Unit 4, but fiscal and monetary policy can re reduce a negative output gap or recessionary gap, or it could reduce an inflationary gap, or it could increase those gaps. So, in this graph we have here, aggregate demand, short-run aggregate supply, long-run aggregate supply. Right now we have a recessionary gap because the aggregate demand curve is below the long-run aggregate supply curve. So, what would we would do was is expansionary fiscal or expansionary monetary or both to actually speed up the economy to increase aggregate demand to the long-run aggregate supply. So, when we have expansionary fiscal and expansionary monetary policy, that expands the aggregate demand curve all the way over here, reducing the negative output gap. And we can do the, completely the same thing with uh, inflationary gap, but instead we use contractionary fiscal and contractionary monetary policy. So what you see here, if we use expansionary monetary and expansionary fiscal policy, our money supply increases because interest rates decrease because of our three different levers, increase in bank loans, this isn't really that important. The price level increases, and you can tell that by just a graph, the entire equilibrium price went from here all the way here. Real output increases because you're expanding the economy, you're speeding up the economy. Unemployment decreases because of economic growth, the budget surplus decreases, and national debt increases, and what's not on here right now is that inflation increases as well. Now it's time to talk about the Phillips Curve. The Phillips Curve is just a relationship between inflation and unemployment. It's a simple graph. On the x-axis, we have the unemployment rate. On the y-axis, we have inflation rate, and we have two different lines. This line, a negative sloping line, is the short-run Phillips Curve. It shows that inflation and unemployment have a negative or inverse relationship. So, what that means is, the higher the inflation it is in the short run, the lower unemployment rate is. So here, inflation is really, really high, but unemployment is really low. Here, unemployment's really high, but inflation's really low. So, it's a negative relationship. When we have a really high rate of inflation, but a low rate of unemployment, that's an inflationary gap. The economy is growing so fast that there's a huge amount of inflation that's going on, but everyone has a job. On this part, we have a recessionary gap. Inflation's not that high because the economy isn't growing that much, but everyone, a lot of people don't have a job. So that's the short run Phillips curve. And make sure you remember that the short run is a negative sloping curve. This is a long-run Phillips curve. Economists argue that in the long run, there is no relationship between inflation and unemployment. That we could have really high inflation, really high unemployment. That's stagflation up here. Or we could have really low inflation, really low unemployment. So in the long run, there is no relationship. In the short run, there is a negative relationship. Just make sure you remember all of that about the velocity of money. The velocity of money is kind of in the name. It's basically the speed at which money is being spent. If you don't really understand what that means, just think of it like this. If the velocity of money is really low, that means that money overall is not going to be spent that much because less and less people are spending money. But if the velocity of money is really high, that means consumer demand is really high. That means a lot of people are spending money. So the velocity, the speed at which money is being used is higher. So think of it kind of as the speed of which money is being spent in the economy. So if I spent $1, the velocity of money would measure how many times that $1 is spent throughout the economy. Because when I spend a dollar, let's say at Walmart, the Walmart manager will take the profit from the dollar, so whatever that is, and then spend a dollar at another store, and then so on and so forth. The economy is entirely circular, so money is being spent. It's measuring how fast that money is. The quantity theory of money is a theory that states the relationship between the general price of goods and the money in circulation. And we have a simple formula. It's not too intimidating, even though it does look like it. On one side, money supply times the velocity equals price times quantity. So you might see a few questions that are like, the money supply is 30 billion, the velocity is 4 what is the price and quantity? Or it'll give you three of the variables. It will ask you to solve for one or something like that. Make sure you remember this formula, mv equals px. That 
basically shows you the rate at which money is being spent in the economy almost and its relationship between price and quantity. So now we can talk about government deficits in the national debt. We've talked about this briefly in the past, but let's fully understand it. The national debt is the total accumulation of all budget surpluses and deficits. So let's say I just created an economy right now in 2025. Remember, a budget surplus is when the government spends more than they save. So let's say the government earns a billion dollars but spends 700 billion. That means a budget surplus is 250 billion. A budget deficit is when the government earns less than they spend. So that means that the government, let's say, spent a billion dollars and they earned 700 billion. That means the deficit's 250 billion. So just understand that. These are both for one year, one singular year. So let's say we made a government in 2025. We, in the first year, we earn a trillion dollars, but we spend 750 billion dollars. That means our surplus is 250 billion. So we actually don't have any debt. We have $250 billion in surplus. But then in the second year, let's say that we're earning $1 trillion, but we're spending $2 trillion, really high increase in spending. That means that we have a trillion dollar deficit. So what do we do then? We add the two. So a trillion dollar deficit plus the $250 billion surplus from last year, and our total debt is $750 billion. So the national debt is just an accumulation of all the deficits or all the surpluses we've had in the past. The theory of crowding out or the crowding out effect suggests that when the government increases its spending, it will increase the demand for goods and services, which leads to higher inflation and interest rates. So the idea here is that when the government increases spending, it's increasing the economy. Remember the formula for GDP? Government spending is a big part of that. When the government spends, like in fiscal policy for instance, expansionary fiscal policy, when the government spends more and more money, it speeds up the economy because there's more money in circulation. But when there's more money in circulation, when there's higher demand for goods and services, that leads to higher inflation, higher interest rates, things like that. So just remember the crowding out effect is this idea that when the government gets involved, that leads to higher inflation. So now we can talk about economic growth, which we've also talked about in the past, but let's fully understand it. Economic growth is when GDP increases. So the amount of goods we can create in a year increases. And then on the other side, economic degrowth is when GDP decreases. There's five key things that a country needs for economic growth. First, a decent economic system. EP macro is... It's very Americanized. It's basically saying capitalism is the best political system, even if you disagree or agree. Capitalism promotes innovation and provides incentives to improve productivity. That's what AP Macro wants you to answer if they ever ask you about economic systems. The second idea is the rule of law. Countries with solid institutions and political stability historically have more economic growth. Third, capital stock. And capital stock is basically machinery, tools. Countries that are more productive typically have more capital stock, more machinery. For instance, what do you, if you were transporting, let's say, a bag of, bag of rice from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco, California, you would rather have high capital stock. So let's say there's a train or there's a plane. That helps improve the economy more because you can get to San Francisco quicker. But let's say you don't have capital stock. You're forced to walk or you're forced to take a horse and buggy. That's very slow and hurts the economy. So capital stock is really important. Fourth is human capital. Countries that have better education, training, are more productive. Human capital is this idea of knowledge. People that are more educated and have more skills and tools can better improve the economy. Then fifth is natural resources. In general, countries that have access to more natural resources are more productive. So if you have more natural resources like oil or um, iron, silver, gold, that can help your economic growth. But not always. There's some intricacies to that. But in AP Macro, yes. So remember, these five are general ideas behind economic growth. There could be more that they test you on. Finally is the idea of public policy and economic growth. There are three key government policies that help promote economic growth. And this is generally called supply-side fiscal policy. First is education and training spending. 
this increases human capital because when people have more education they have they're more knowledgeable they learn more skills which overall improves human capital second is infrastructure spending things like roads bridges harbors planes airports all that stuff it increases physical capital then third production and investment incentive programs so basically um incentives tax credits money all that stuff that incentivizes investment and production that increases physical capital because companies will invest more and more in machinery but it also can improve human capital as com companies will spend more on education training all that stuff so production and investment incentive programs can help boost the economy all of these are called supply side policy they improve our supply overall and you can notice all three of these tie into these as well because the idea behind the public policy and economic growth is that we're trying to increase these five main pillars right here so that's all unit five you can tell unit five is kind of just talking about economic growth really and monetary fiscal policy the best thing to understand is how all of this relates to the previous units because almost every question in here it relates to a previous unit here we talk about fiscal and monetary policy, how it can reduce inflationary and contractionary uh, gaps. Make sure you know how to do that and how to graph those. The Phillips curve, pretty self-explanatory. We've talked about this in the past, unemployment and inflation. Just remember in the long run, there's no real relationship. Money velocity, we've talked about this in the past as well with monetary policy is basically the speed at which money is being spent. Remember this main formula, no complicated math questions are going to come up on AP Macro, but you are allowed a calculator. Just make sure you know how to calculate these and understand if one, maybe even two variables are missing. Government deficits and the national debt. Just know national debt is the total accumulation of all the surpluses and deficits. And that a deficit increases the debt, a surplus decreases the debt, and that expansionary fiscal policy increases the debt because you're spending more. And contractionary fiscal policy reduces the debt because you're spending less. Crowding out effect, again, similar to what we've learned in the past, when the government increases spending, it leads to higher inflation because the economy is growing more and more. And then understand the ideas of economic growth and the ways that our government can help that. If you're not really understanding all of this unit, in the description of this video, there's around 18 to 20 different questions that can help you better understand every single concept here and some practice problems where you graph different problems. The Phillips curve, fiscal, monitor, fiscal and monetary policy, and much more.